Welcome along. We are with Gwynoro Jones, the author of Whose Wills? The Battle for Welsh Devolution and Nationhood 1880 to 2020. The book looks at really the political structure of Wales and the political battles of Wales over the last century. And Gwynoro has been involved in that himself as a former MP in Carmarthenshire. He joins us now in the studio to talk about the book. Gwynoro, welcome along. Le- looking at this now, the, the preface here is uh, Diane Hopkins. Martin Shipton has written an introduction as well. Alan Gibbard has uh, co-authored it with you, uh, uh, You know, a writer of great standing in Wales. Um, just give us a brief synopsis then of this book. Well, I sat down one day with Alan. Uh, we'd written Gwynoro on Gwynoro in Welsh. And uh, we thought, well, what can we do next? And we came to the decision, let's write about how we got to where we are today. How did we get to the Senedd? And in that discussion, in that discussion, we started, okay, when did all this start impacting on Wales? And it started around the 1880s with the Home Rule campaign, Gladstone, Home Rule for Ireland, also in Wales, there were people, Cymru Vydd, without going into the details of it now, it goes back to those days. And by the way, it is very interesting. We've just been announced in recent days that now Wales is going to have a constitutional commission. And what is that going to be about? It's going to be about the future governance of Wales. Could be Home Rule, who knows? So here we are, 150 years later, we are talking about issues that were on the agenda in the 1880s. And we've tried to trace how did the powers, how did it all come about from those days of the Liberal government, then to the birth of the Labour Party, K. Hardy, who, by the way, who believed in home rule himself, then the two world wars, and devolution died down a bit, of necessity because of two world wars, then the emergence of influential people like Jim Griffiths, the campaign for a parliament for Wales in the 50s, and many other things. So we've traced the story for 150 years. That's what we've done. We've seen the establishment of the Welsh Assembly, now the Welsh Parliament, 1997. Many who maybe are not as acutely aware of the politics of Wales and how this came about might be forgiven for believing, you know, that this was uh, Plaid Cymru, the nationalists, the Welsh-speaking, you know, heartlands of Wales. There is more to it than that, isn't there? We're talking about, you know, as you say, John Smith, the Labour government and and his predecessors, uh, uh, Jim Griffiths and so on. Is it is it is it sort of you know for people who are not educated in in this area really, Plaid have had a big part to play uh, in this, but this this has come about really as a much wider influence and participation from so many different factors. Yes, that is one of the main reasons why the book was written. Every political party has had a stake in where Wales is today. No one party can claim total credit for it all. The Liberal Party can claim big credit from the 1880s to about 1920. A lot of things were done then in relation to the institutions in Wales, the National Museum, the National Library, the Welsh Joint Education System, uh, the disestablishment of the church with the Church of Wales, all sorts of things. Then you've got the Labour governments of the 50s and the 60s that created the Secretary of State, the Welsh office. Then you've got years where the Tories were in power again and they did strengthen the powers of the Welsh office. You have people like Gwynwar Evans who campaigned, not for independence, by the way, Gwynfor was not like what Adam Price has been preaching. Gwynfor believed in a confederation. He didn't believe in out and right 
independence, which rather surprised me until I read about many things he's written in later life after he ceased being a member of parliament. Then the Blair government with the Welsh Assembly, and then all for the 20 years afterwards, the various powers that has come Wales's way, even even under a, a, Campbell, a Cameron government, Wales had more powers. So the purpose of the book was to say, no party can claim credit, full stop. It, it reminds me really of a jigsaw puzzle of, of, of Wales itself. You throw it on the floor and you can sort of, there's so many pieces to put together, knowing where those pieces fit in. And then, uh, you know, you get an overview, you get an idea of the struggles. We, we've, we've got an identity crisis, haven't we, we, in Wales? We've got a chip on our shoulder and this book addresses some of that as well, doesn't it? Yes, well, the biggest the biggest problem by now. Well, first of all, Wales has always been divided as to its future. It's now a big issue, isn't it? The Tory Party in Wales is reluctantly accepting devolution and trying to argue that Wales is under the coronavirus, for instance, is taking upon itself more powers than it should. It should work closer with the Westminster government and on 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 and on in that way. Wales has always been divided. In the days of Lloyd George, they were divided. Lloyd George wanted home rule for Wales. The South Wales Liberal Party couldn't accept what Lloyd George wanted. And they sent him away from a big debate and a big meeting in Newport with a huge flea in his ear. And after that debate, Lloyd George gave up on home rule because he knew that the Welsh people wouldn't accept it. Division has been part of Wales's future and f- prospects. One reason, we are tribes. And what are the tribes now? Forget the princes, tribes of the old days, the old princes. We've got modern tribes. We've got a Welsh-speaking tribe. We've got a tribe that is Welsh and a bit of a British in them. We've got people in Wales who are British out and out, unionists out and out. We've got other people in Wales who are English, and only English, and other people who are English and British. You know, we've got, as you said, we are now a mosaic, and that is one of the complications when we start talking about the future. Martin Shipton made uh, an interesting point in his preface. He talks about the mythology. We are a, st- a nation of storytellers. We believe or we certainly uh, promulgate these myths. And uh, he talks about, you know, the myth of Plaid Cymru establishing and being the, 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 f- the main influence for devolution in Wales. This book, to a certain extent, does disprove that. It's not that you set out to do that, but the facts are facts. Well, that was the purpose. It, I, I had no intention of saying Plaid Cymru don't matter. You know, <laughs> nobody would expect me to say that because I fought three general elections against his leader and I know full well Plaid Cymru did matter and were influential in many, many ways. But they were only a small part, and I repeat that word, a small part of the whole campaign and struggle. That is the issue. And yes, you see, the myth about Plaid Cymru that Shipton talks about all came about around Gwynvor, you see. That is, that is the, the reality of it. Gwynvor was set on a pedestal and his supporters placed him there in many, many ways and he was idolised by his followers and there were people in the Welsh media that idolise him and there are people in the Welsh media today who still idolise that myth. So the book didn't set out to destroy the myth at all. The book set out to establish, as you quite rightly say, what are the facts? When did X, Y, Z happen? When did this happen? When did that? When there were more powers given at different stages along the 150 years? And in that, I conclude, Alan might not conclude, that what is essential is what does the Labour Party believe in? Because a Secretary of State and a Welsh office were set by, up by Harold Wilson. The Welsh Assembly was set up by Tony Blair. Now, 
when we talk now of the 2020s, what does the Labour Party now think is going to happen to Wales? Well, that's we're coming to the end of this, so I don't want to give it all away. But we've we've had a discussion uh, at at some point earlier on as well about uh, the the new uh, you know debate really for the Commission for the future of the of Wales within the Union of the UK. Uh, Martin Shipton makes that point. He says a quarter of a century late, uh, the future of the UK is uncertain. Within a few years, both Scotland and Northern Ireland may have left the UK, and at that point, the people of Wales would have to decide on their future. Would they be content to face permanent domination by their much bigger neighbours to the east, i.e. England, or would they take the plunge and decide on independence? Gwinoro, this is another chapter uh, that is yet to be written, but w- w- what's your prediction? Oh gosh, <coughs> my prediction is Scotland will be independent within 10 years, there will be a united Ireland within 10, 15 years. And by the way, when I say United Ireland, I don't necessarily mean one parliament. You can't have a confederal structure in Ireland where there's a parliament in Stormont and in Dublin, a parliament in Northern Ireland and a parliament in Southern Ireland with their own authority and an overarching council between the two governments. That's how I see Ireland going. Then, then you have the, the question, what about Wales? What's going to happen to Wales? And we have now a commission, a constitutional commission, to start the ball rolling. Where will we be in five years' time or whatever? The ball is in our court, and we've got to start thinking of the future. There we go. <clears throat> the book Who's Wales is available online. I believe you can get it on Amazon. And it's by Gwinoro Jones and Arlen Gibbard. Gwinoro, many thanks for joining us in the studio today. Take it out.